Well, I was obliged to join the King's Regiment as a political move to do two years of compulsory national service. It ended up that I went into an infantry assault regiment that did combat duties in Korea. I, I was quite uh, attuned to it because it was upholding a tenant of the United Nations Security Council have approved the fighting in Korea, and let's not do all the talking, let's show that we've got some teeth. It was an up and down business, and Korea is still uh, not sorted out yet. It's still a very contentious thing, and it has been all along, but we did our bit. The, the comforting thing is that South Korea has blossomed in a very rare way. And uh, this photograph I've just shown you is proof of that. And North Korea has put its energy and effort in a different direction. And there's still not any solution, but I have the satisfaction of serving in an infantry regiment that has to do some real old fashioned fighting reminiscent of World War I. But I survived it mercifully. The experience doesn't ever leave you. It's become dormant. And as I do this program, I've re-examined some of the past ups and downs, which have made me more, what was the word we use? Tough. You've got to get something done. I mean, I, I was not in a, this is a, a, a regiment like the PECO. I was in an assault regiment that did the fighting and the front line. And those soldiers were tough guys and very good soldiers. But don't cross them at the wrong time, you see. It's a two-edged sword. Oh, dear me, I've raked up some things that I've forgotten about. And there was me with my little typewriter in the HQ, sounded very uh, less at home. I don't know. It took a while to break over these things, you know that? Mm -hmm. I, I'm very grateful for this opportunity. Incidentally, my doctor here, Dr. Kelpin, who was just down the road, his father was in the Canadian Navy, and there's a a bench on the, the waterfront, just down from a hill, um, commemorating the sinking of a ship, HMS, HMS C. Skeena. It's a river class destroyer, and it was torpedoed off the, the coast of Iceland. And uh, there wasn't enough room in the lifeboat. So they tied him to the lifeboat. And when the, he was washed ashore in the morning, he'd lost the use of his legs. And he's a pretty decent hockey player. And my doctor tells the story. Uh, he never played hockey with his boys again, but he got his life. He, he, he's very keen on uh, investments. He's helped me quite a bit in a way. Yeah, and that bench is just down the, on the seafront, right in line with us. And in this very library, I, I asked them, have you got anything about HMCS Skeena? And they said, oh yeah, this girl, Miss Bourne, who was the older, she knew all about the naval details, <laughs> which is encouraging. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I get quite a lot of help from the doctor to understand veterans. Right. So that, that's a good thing, don't you think? Well, this is where I get personal now. I, it put the EBGBs up me, I'll tell you. I mean, it took four weeks to get to Hong Kong on a very crowded troop ship, but you put the thoughts aside, you just got through the day somehow on, on a very crowded ship. And then we got up to the border in Hong Kong where we were going to do final battle training, which is fair enough. 
but I got a weekend pass. It's 28 miles from the Chinese border to Hong Kong. And a little trip down on the train, getting out of the camp was a release, you know. And I, I didn't know anybody. I just wanted around Hong Kong as a free agent. And I went into YMCA, and there was this Life magazine with pictures of the latest incursion by the Chinese. And the American Marines had done a amphibious operation in northeastern Korea, right up by the Chinese border. They were trying to destroy the dams on a reservoir, it was right up there. And it was in winter, and bitterly cold, and the Chinese interfered. And the Marines, for the first time in their history, I believe, retreated as best they could. It is a mountain, see, they had to get from the shore through the mountains to where the lake was, where the reservoir was. And their job was to blow up the reservoir, blow up the dam. Well, they didn't get to the dam. In the, and in the meantime, they took tremendous casualties. Well, they did, fought on with marine spirits. I have great respect for the American Marines but they were obliged to turn around and try and get back and uh, off the beach again. And they had terrible casualties. And I was reading about this in this uh, nice warm room in Hong Kong, and I thought, this is what we're in for. <laughs> Why you, we weren't told about this one. The Chinese intervention made a the crucial difference, I can tell you, as North Korean troops were quite well organized at the beginning of the war. And they made unexpected, see, the intelligence was not very good. The Americans had plenty of troops in Japan and in South Korea, but they had five years of indolence, just being uh, occupation troops and enjoy themselves. And they, they got soft. And all of a sudden they picked up from, especially the Japanese ones, they picked up from the cushy job in Japan, put in the front line to fight the Chinese. There's no contest. The war went from north all the way down to very close to Pusan. In fact, there was a possibility that they would be kicked out altogether over the terrible defeat. So then the uh, Americans sent out a cry for help, and 16 countries lined up. And it's amazing, they were very diverse countries. There's Colombia, there's France, there's the British crowd and the British Commonwealth, but there are all kinds of countries. The Turks, yeah. I'll give you a little hint here. If you ever fight the Turks, make sure you fight on their side. I, I was talking in Malaysia about this <laughs> originally. One of my friends it was in the Canadian contingent. They were fighting near the Turks, and the Turks were hopelessly outnumbered. And they were given the option to retreat. And the Turkish camp said, retreat? We're not retreating, we're Turks. Allah has given us a chance to kill as many North Koreans and Chinese as possible, and Allah will look after us. And he's also given us this opportunity of killing people we don't like. Let's get on with it. What do you think of that attitude? It, you don't fight people like that. See, that's what went wrong with that battle in World War I, the Dardanelles. The Turks were very, very warlike people from Central Asia, and it's still in their genes, and you don't meddle with them. Okay. Incidentally, one of the jobs I did uh, towards the end of my time in Japan was in interrogate, not interrogate is the right word, identify returned prisoners of war. And it was such an interesting job. Uh, the different countries had, of course, had different 
attitudes or POWs. No Turkish POW was indoctrinated, and Americans had quite a number, the British had some, and so on, but the Turks, none. And if, it, if they'd gone over to the other side, the Turks would have gone after them themselves. It's like, <laughs> that's a little side thing there, but the, the Turks were, Still, uh, Asiatic nomads, and that's the way they were. They only just extricated a handful of people, and the Chinese came down in numbers that amazed MacArthur. Just amazing. And he said, well, the only thing to do is bomb China, the troops assembling across the Yalu River, that's the difference in Korea and China, will bomb them before they get across the river. And that's when Truman, uh, not Truman, yeah, Truman said, just a minute, hold on, what we're getting into. Can you understand that? You start bombing China itself, it's, it's going to trigger off something much bigger than this little contained war in Korea. Anyway, the, the Chinese intervention made a serious difference, and it still does. I think China's behind what's happening in North Korea today, in spite of the fact they say they're not. I don't think the North Koreans have got the technology to build those rockets. Do, do you think so? It's, uh, and the money, you know, my, my incursions into North Korea le left me with the, the idea that North Korea was an impoverished country and still was relatively impoverished, except for that town just north of the border, the 38th border, where the South Koreans have put serious money into it. And everybody looks the other way when it's in North Korea because it's making so much money. I think the technology must emanate from that area. It's, it's not what I saw. It's very, it looks very prosperous when you get these uh, shots. So there you go. Incidentally, I took my wife and daughter there in recent times, and it was still very tricky. The chicken grenades at each other, and it's the first time that the, this they allowed tourists up to a point to go and see the DMZ, the, the Americans call it, the demilitarized zone. But my daughter was, she was only about 14 at the time, and she had a very sharp memory. She said, I, I never forget that uh, atmosphere. She said, there was a long cut, and the table was set on either side of an imaginary line, which was a 38th parallel. Can you imagine? And the North Koreans were sitting on one side of that imaginary line in the, in the hut, and the Americans were sitting on the other. And we were allowed to see this. And then they said to me, would you like to go out on patrol? Because they were patrolling quite vigorously at the time, along the line. But I've never been so happy to be with a big, big bunch of American Marines, the big, chunky guys. And I made sure my wife and daughter got right in the middle of them. <laughs> Because they were chucking grenades around, you know, all, all the time we were on that little excursion. And I thought, no wonder it stuck in my daughter's uh, memory. She'd never seen that kind of animosity before. It was, it, the Koreans had been split artificially from North Koreans and South Koreans. They were all Koreans before the big power started working. You see what I mean? It's a bit like East Germany and West Germany. 
And it was quite an education for her. So that would be the answer to my question. Um, that magazine was a wake-up call. Uh, We were warned about the cold and how to fight in all circumstances. We had decent clothing, actually, for, the, for that terrain. But we didn't have the uh, personal um, experiences to uh, the, wake us up. Yeah. So that's my answer to that one. Incidentally, in the late 70s, there was a law in interest in the, these martial laws and so on. They just wanted to sweep them under the carpet. So the, the World War II and Korea were too close together for comfort. I personally thought that it could develop into a third world war without any trouble at all. You see what I mean? And that's why. Uh, I'm a bit like you, I read history quite carefully. And it could have spun into a Third World War without too much trouble. And the, but we didn't want to do that because we had new, fresh memories lingered in our minds. I, I used the word linger carefully. They lingered in our minds about what it was like. And we didn't want a repetition because it gets you nowhere except a lot of damage and wreckage and bloodshed and slaughter and so on. Uh, it makes you wonder why, uh, what the human race can do. All those kings, uh, how you, Greenwood always talks about, they were not up to the job of sorting out a complex political situation. Well, the democracies in 1930, late 1930, did no better job of dealing with Hitler before he started throwing his weight around. So uh, he won't have that. Somehow uh, he, he's, he's down on the kings. And I am also agree with him on that, but I, when they elected the democratic governments, such as Churchill and uh, the French guys and so on tried to handle it. They were no better. It's a human failing, I think. Don't tell Ali Greenwood. Does it? <laughs> well, I don't know where to start. There was a definite feeling of uh, camaraderie. It, and it wasn't built up and fostered, it just was there. Uh, a few nights ago we had a, a guest for dinner. She's an old lady, she's a Kiwi from New Zealand. And she refers to Britain as the mother country. Still, my, my uh, brothers went off to help the mother country. N naturally, there's no question involved. And that's the way it was. But we had a common language common heritage, common history, and it called to the colors came naturally. It came in 1939, and when the uh, United Nations, now I'm very strong on the United Nations. I can't get Harry Greenwood to go along with this. The United Nations did a good job. The Security Council of five, mem five permanent members met to do something about the Korean war. Russia vetoed, uh, would veto anything, but they didn't attend because they were annoyed. And that gave them a chance to pass an, uh, a resolution uh, unanimously. So the other four voted to do something about Korea. And I, I don't think my fellow soldiers were cognizant of this, but whenever I had the opportunity, I rubbed it in. We're not fighting here for next to nothing. We're fighting for a, a good reason, and there's time to come when you have to go and show the teeth. 
No, I'm just talking around a, a, a table in a, you know, a, in a conference room. Do you agree with me on that one? You know, uh, you know I don't know. There were very tangible things. I mean, I told the story how the Australians helped me when I was kicked out of the hospital on Christmas Eve. Oh, instead, <laughs> yeah, I got my morning cup of coffee with later with rum. It happens every day, every year. In my, even my son's mother-in-law sent some Christmas morning coffee, especially for that ceremony. <laughs> These little things make it uh, take the edge off the horror. Don't you think so? Yeah, and it also makes them realize that it's a, some people have to do it. Um, the Canadian contribution to my uh, knowledge of the Commonwealth at the time was, uh, interesting enough, mainly from the Van Dues, which is a double interest because the Van Dues, believe it or not, had trouble fitting into the Canadian Army at all. Because the, name, the Canadian Army was assumed to be uh, a British kind of organization, which had beaten the French uh, at that famous battle, and they were still nursing their wounds. But I'll tell you, the bloody good soldiers, the Vandus, the, the Vandus stand and fight, they don't want to treat. And there was a guy next to me in the hospital, I told you this, who gave me his badge. I showed you that over there. And when I lost the badge, it was replaced by return mail. It was very, um, in, in the interest of Canadian unity, it was very encouraging. Do you know that? Very encouraging. But in that camp, which was a big sprawling camp on the edge of Kyori in Japan, where you went when you first, some people went there at first. And the different commonwealth countries had their sh allotment and so on. The Van Dues were almost a separate entity, even by their Canadian friends. And I went in the, the Van Du uh, pub and was well received and got a badge and I thought, what's wrong with everybody? But I think the English-speaking soldiers uh, have been brought up to dislike the Vendors. And that's a reasonable assumption. <laughs> but there were so many human beings and bloody good fighters and bloody tough guys. They were used to the cold. I used to feel sorry for the Australians who'd never seen snow. Imagine. Oh dear. Anyway, that's, there were lots of instances where we demarcated ourselves from the Americans. Because we didn't like the American assumption that they the only people who could fight, the only people who knew how to fight and the, the Americans are basically softer. Do you know what I mean? A lot of Canadian soldiers I spoke to, especially the ones in hospital where I met, see, you don't meet them when you're in Korea very much, because you may not be positioned next to them. But in the hospital, you're in, you, you won't believe the crowd, how crowded the hospital was. It's a bed every couple of inches. But it's better than lying on the battlefield the way they used to. But where we're going with this, they, there was a, a tremendous mix-up of Canadians, Australians, Kiwis, British guys. And we had this feeling that we had something in common. So it's an intangible feeling, but it was there. There were better fighters. And we, if we did retreat, we took our supplies with us. We were conditioned not to leave anything behind if we had a retreat. Now the Princess Pats, the Western Regiment, 
they got an American citation for, the way, for, for standing still and fighting. And that's the spirit that was shown by a British regiment called the Glasses. And the ants were made, these guys are running out of ammunition and haven't retreated. Yeah. The ants didn't like it. I, I think the ants have been brought up in easy living. The, the, Amer the Canadian soldiers I met were mainly from the east. Not all, but from the And they had a refinery, they worked in the, the uh, woods. And the winter was severe, just as it was in Korea. And they said, oh, it's cold, what do you tell me something I don't know? <laughs>
with. The Australians wouldn't fight without fresh meat and fresh fruit and that kind of thing, and lots of beer. So it was, it was interesting to see. I leave in Tokyo before I went, went home. And the camp was called Ebisu in the middle of Tokyo. And that's where the four main countries of the Commonwealth mixed. And you could see there was um, quite a lot of camaraderie there, which it, you, you can't take it away. But there's also a bit of rivalry, <laughs> especially when one crowd got too much money. What was it so like when you first saw it? Well, I, I tell you what it was like. It was winter, it was deep in snow, it had been fought over twice. It looked like the, those shots you see of Syrian towns today. It, it smashed to pieces and people were, well, mainly women and children. The men had gone, they were in the fighting line and they were huddled up in the snow. It was terrible. And now you go to Seoul, it's freeways and high rises. The change is incredible, absolutely incredible. And um, that's why they make so much fuss. We uh, live with the idea that we did a worthwhile thing in South Korea. I don't know if you agree with that or not, but. I've got a photograph to show you about that in a moment. But South Korea is an uh, industrial success. North Korea is a one-sided thing. The, the peasants are still living at a poverty level while they, they spend what money they have on munitions. Yeah. I, I didn't actually write any articles for the Liverpool newspaper because I never got the sense of uh, okay to do it. But I did write to, to my, the new newsletter of the church I used to send when I was a boy. And I've still got a copy of it. If you're interested, I can produce that. It's a day-to-day -day breakdown of what we did. And that's what I had in mind to do. Um, the Liverpool paper was published like the Sun, and I could send an article up. And of course, the ways of getting the information are a bit crude in those days, but it would get there, but I never got the chance to use it because I, I got that terrible fever, which changed the whole uh, story. Or, I mean, I, I don't know if I want to even talk about it. It was like a plague uh, from the Middle Ages, and I've never sorted it out whether it comes from lice carried by the rats or from the droppings of the rats. I've talked to doctors about this and the, the uh, opinion is still not firm. But the rats were terrible, I can tell you. The biggest rats I've ever seen. We used to bane at them before they could get away. Can you imagine? The, well, I'll just tell you slightly. The filth of generations was in those bloody trenches. And the rats thrived on it. They're very tenacious creatures and they're disconcerting when you live in a country like Canada. You, uh, you, you don't see rats very often, but they're still around. They're still around, but the Koreans were accustomed to them and we're not disconcerted the way we are. But there are bloody nuisance. You get into your sleeping bag at night and you feel something crawling over you. It's a bloody big rat.
İlçeden ilçeden başlayayım belki de size ünlü en iyi doğrudan sonra yani akan çok familyal ve açı o incidenti, böyle bir incidenti when the Chinese and North Koreans took the company by surprise and the dead of night is called everybody's in the sleeping bag and they couldn't get out of the sleeping bag fast enough to re re return the fire and the, the whole company was wiped out and a band went on using sleeping bags they had to use loose blankets which were not nearly efficient but if you are in the midst you throw the blanket off and you're ready to go wriggling out of the sleeping bag no matter how fast you are it takes time and to my uh, amazement sleeping bags were banned totally banned which made sleeping the night a different uh, issue yeah that just came to me oh i'll be happy to do that because it's um it's like light at the end of the tunnel i've been in this hospital for about six weeks and i was still alive now there, there was a high mortality rate for people who had that fever and um I, incidentally, I was the only one in my regiment to contract it. And um, it was really painful. I was very disconcerted. You were coughing blood all the time. You couldn't eat anything. And for some reason, I didn't get the intravenous feeding. I don't think it was available. It certainly was available from a medical point of view, but it wasn't available in the hospital. So if you couldn't digest something, you didn't eat. I couldn't keep anything down. I didn't want to eat. And when I, you know, cough, blood came up, and eventually the blood coughing up overtakes you and you die. Some people in that ward died every day. So it, it became a routine thing. But anyway, I was still around, and it was Christmas Eve, and the colonel, the full colonel who was running the hospital, made a special visit. He said, Langley, he said, it's Christmas Eve. Um, you're still alive. Would you like to be discharged? I said, oh, yes, sir. He said, there's one caveat. You're not to drink any booze. Now, booze was fr freely available. I said, well, I promise not to say it. Cross my heart. He said, all right, get your kid packed and get out of here before I change my mind. So I packed my kid. I didn't have much to pack. And I, I, I was a total blank out. I was supposed to get from the hospital bed to the British camp. I, I don't know. They just turned me out into the black night with my rifle and my kid bag. And uh, a very weak person. In fact, very weak. <laughs> Just left to my own uh, imagination to find it. But these artists came along and they could see I was in distress. And the big guys, the Australian commandos, who fought the Japanese in New Guinea, and they took pity on me. And they said, where are you going, Mike? I said, I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> Can you help me? And they said, well, before we help you, you we're going to look after you, we're going to take you to the Aussie pub. Oh, I can't drink, I promised the colonel. He said, well, just have a little bit. You know how that goes. To sit down at the table, you put some money in the middle, and then you can sit down. And I had only army, the British Army script. It wasn't legal currency, but it was within the camps. So I put 10 shillings down, which was a joke for the Australians. So we had a few drinks and I enjoyed it because there's no booze in the hospital ward. And I, after that, I don't remember very much except waking up at 6 a.m. I heard the bugle going at 6 a.m. in the British camp and the right bed. Somehow the Australians had got me to the British camp and found the correct bed, which had been allocated to me. And there's the Sergeant Major and the Sergeant 
one with a big canteen of tea and the other with a huge bottle of rum and trying to wake me up. I blew my eyes and I said, what the hell did I get here? <laughs> Can you imagine? <laughs> Can you imagine? Because <laughs> I, I was weak, I didn't, a uh, bit of booze knocked me out very quickly. I was in the right bed and two strangers were offering me tea laced with rum. <laughs> it was, no wonder it became a family ritual. Yeah, well, that's that story. And it, it, the, the kids and say, my wife, they do it very dutifully. Uh, <laughs> well, you, you've got to see the funny side of these things, don't you think so? Yes, yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> just forgive me for a minute, will you? Of course. Yeah. I never knew a British sergeant major could be so kind. But only for the day, though. Now, at midday, no, let's talk about this. It was a, and it's a practice in the Canadian Army, too. The officers wait on the men at midday meal on a Christmas day. Uh, I've checked with the boys in the KVA, community vets here. The officers put their little aprons on and they uh, serve the meal. And it's, a, it's an old custom coming from England where the lord of the manor serves, the, uh, serves a meal for the work they've done for him on his estate during the, during the year. And it's uh, the army, the British army has always been based on rules uh, of royal uh, um, demarcation and social uh, layers and all that kind of thing. But they break it on that day and it was broken. That's why they, they had this um, ma magnificent meal. And the, the, we never had, here's the thing to think about, Tristan. The, the food was from Australia. The situation five years after World War II was ended in Britain was no better than it was during the war. The, the bread was rationed. It was not rationed during the war. Gasoline was rationed. Although gasoline was not available during the war, but, um, there, there was no canned fruit from Australia or that kind of thing. And it was just flowing uh, this Christmas day. And you have these senior officers uh, carving meat in front of you. <laughs> it makes you feel you know, you, you're not a, a Russian serf. You don't, don't you, you've got the general ambience. Yeah, that was a good occasion. Yeah. Yeah. I've still got the menu. Can you imagine? And I also know that the Canadian Army follows the same ritual. It's a ritual. And, you know, I, I, I can see what the Americans do. The Americans recruit their soldiers from any place in the United States, which makes them uh, indifferent to each other, I think. My regiment was uh, recruited from a very specific area. Everybody knew each other. I got a Christmas calendar from my sister who lives in Liverpool, and in it was a uh, uh, in the month of April, there was a, a, a photograph of the cenotaph to the King's Regiment, Liverpool, who, who fought in all these wars. And there's a very, there was, and I have to tell you, it doesn't seem to be around very much now. You could not walk into a pub and buy a drink. If, you, if they knew you were a member of that regiment. The drinks were on, you, on the house, and people get, gathered around 
and buy you drinks. And it was because they were proud of being the local regiment. And that gave you a sense of comradeship, don't you think? Now, in, in Canadian terms, the PBCLI, which have that fancy name, they, they do the same thing. And uh, they stick together, where the Americans can be from anywhere, and they dislike each other because they come from different parts of the United States. Now, the thinking behind this is, if there's a bad occasion and a lot of men are going to be killed, they all come from the same area. So there's a lot of casualties to be dealt with from a very concentrated area. Now that, that is a consideration. But the other way of doing it is you fight harder if you know that your buddies are still judging you. And they judge you when you get home. And if you didn't stand up in battle, you better not go to the local pub. Do you get the idea, Tristan? And it, it does no harm. <laughs> You're laughing, but it does no harm. Yeah. You, you, you belong to that fraternity. Yeah, that's what it is. Yeah. The beds are very close together, but this bed happened to be opposite me. And for quite a while, I was bedridden. I couldn't get out of bed, it was too weak. And various soldiers would come and sit and talk to me as they wandered around. They had to find their own amusement. But since this guy was right opposite, we got to know each other, especially in the afternoons. The afternoons dragged a bit. In the morning, they'd come around and look after you the best they could. The afternoon was dragged. And he used to sit on my bed and tell me stories about Fra Riviera. And he made it sound so romantic, and it wasn't romantic at all. <laughs> but, you know, he said, I was number one cleaning the log jams, which is a very dangerous job. I thought, this guy's you know, a really interesting guy. And we're talking in what I call Franglais, some French, some English. We're getting along just fine because we're both soldiers. Cornwall soldiers, you see, and there was a bond coming. And I, I wanted the Van Du badge because I was collecting badges. And you see the collection up on the wall there, which is quite a good momentum. And finally, he gave me his badge when he was discharged ahead of me. And I treasured it for years and years and years. And then I lost it at the parking lot in Tawasson. It, it had to be that, because I kept it on my key fob. And I mentioned, uh, we were waiting for the ferry, and it's a routine thing to pull the keys out of your pocket. And I went, hey, badge, it's gone, it's gone. And I looked around the car in, in the gravel, because it wasn't there. And I, I was knocked out, knocked out. And so I wrote to the Vendus in Quebec City. And they send the badge back by return mail. I think that's a, a moving story, don't you? Yeah. yeah, I do. This is getting a bit emotional for me, but when I first went to Quebec City a couple of years ago, it had a sign on the counter Canadian servicemen admitted free. So I said to the woman behind the counter, I was not a Canadian citizen, but I fought in the Korean, in the Commonwealth Division. And she said, oh, she shouted out immediately in English. We've got a Canadian, uh, Korean vet here. And so we're given the royal treatment. And it's, it's very much, um, it's the only barracks in Canada which is open to the public. Did you know that? It's a military functioning People on parade, people doing machine gun training, uh, all the routine things that a soldier does in, in peacetime. It, and it's functioning, and people are coming and going, doing military things. 
and we were shown around, and anybody can go in, but you only see certain parts of it. Now, on that particular day, I was taken down to the inner sanctum where the record of anybody in the Vandus who's been killed is recorded in the, it's called Turning the Leaves. And down in the chapel down below, it, it was about to be done. It's done every morning at 10.30 by the orderly sergeant and an orderly officer. And it's a very sacred tradition. And I, because of what told them a story about the badge, they allowed me to be present. Now, my wife has taken over to the office of mass and shown all the parts that were there and not open to the public. So I thought we had a pretty good visit. And, you know, people don't like the French. Let's not kid ourselves. But when you get to know them, as I did, they're very outgoing people. And my eldest grandson has a French Canadian girlfriend, and she's so boisterous and She's a good girl, she's good looking. She works in, up in the, the oil fields with, her, with my grandson. She works outside 40 below with the men, doing the pipeline. She's good in the kitchen, she drinks more wine than I do. All the stereotypes are there. But the people, the, the energetic people, and that's the problem, they don't like getting pushed around. Well, I don't like getting pushed around. <laughs> but they're colorful people. And when you get on the right side for them, you've got to win it behind you. Uh, I took this girl called Jessica, that's my grandson's girlfriend. I took her up to the Okanagan where they live. And she couldn't believe how, how much wine was available. And she joined a, a, a very elite um, wine club. So instead of going around the hall doing tasting of these spots off the highway, you phone up in advance and they've got a, a flight of wines ready for you on each side of the table. The only trouble is you've got to make sure you've got a, a de designated driver with you. But she can put wine away, but it's part of their culture. And her father came over to see us. At a, he, was, he was puzzled to see what it was like in Western Canada. And he, he drank more bloody wine than his daughter. And they, they love life. You've got to channel it in the right way. Have you been to Quebec very much? The, it's a different experience. I, I do remember, though, right downtown, crossing the main road with the green light in my favor and a huge truck going roaring through. As if there's nothing happening. God mighty. <laughs> <laughs> They're a different breed. <laughs> My wife said to me this morning, make sure you talk about Hiroshima. And I, I will make sure I do, because it's a tricky subject. When I was assigned to duties in Japan, not sent back to Korea for the duration of my natural service, I was assigned to a camp which was half an hour away by train from Hiroshima. Now that was a wonderful fluke of history. And I, I knew what it was all about. I mean, I wasn't just an ordinary soldier. I took advantage of the fact I could go every Sunday afternoon. I got on the damn train 
and went to Hiroshima. I was fascinated by it, fascinated, and by the opportunity it gave me. And the first thing I want to say is, we were told that nothing would grow there for years and years, if at all. It was thriving five years later. They were building ships, so the, the things were growing. You wouldn't know it had been bombed except for the, the commerce building. And it had a kind of spherical t top, and all the steel had survived in spite of the heat. And it survived because it was the epicenter was directly above it. The, the walls had collapsed, and they left this skeleton of a building as a, a memento, because it was directly below the explosion of the bomb. The real damage was done where they, it spread out, and there's always a, a periphery to these things. And p people get, not killed, but terribly wounded. The Americans built a hospital near Hiroshima to deal with people who were wounded. And they were riding up and studying the uh, material, and it got so bad they closed the hospital down and prevented doctors from going there because it was so disconcerting. I don't know what happened to it in the long run. But the people on the edge did worse than the people right in the middle because it, it exploded and spread out. The people in Hiroshima, when I was going there five years later, were in, they didn't throw anything at me. They, um, Except for the fact that they'd lost the war. The emperor had told them to stop fighting. If the emperor hadn't told them to stop fighting, it's anybody's guess how many more casualties would have taken place invading Japan itself. The Japanese would have fought on every hilltop all the way to Tokyo. It, I think in the end it saved human life. But I tell you, this may be a bit confidential between you and me. The Japanese started this business when they bumped Pearl Harbor. And to the American mind said, okay, you want to fight? We'll give you a fight. We'll, we'll finish it with Hiroshima. Uh, don't repeat that, but uh, I think there's something in it. You, you don't the Japanese didn't declare war before they bumped Pearl Harbor. They just came out of the blue. And the, the Americans were sleeping as the whole Japanese fleet crossed the Pacific. Surely they could have got some uh, idea of what was going on, but they didn't. Anyway, my Sunday afternoon visit to Hiroshima gave me a deep respect for the Japanese. And it was cemented by the fact I picked up a lovely Japanese girlfriend and you, the one of these questions is, uh, you know, how, how do you get along with the Japanese? I, I studied their culture carefully. I could do, I couldn't do the kanji now. Do you know anything about Japanese language? There's three systems. I mean, I, I'm a bit of a Greek scholar, and that's bad enough, but Japanese is a test. They borrow from China the basic ideograms. That's called the kanji. Now they've got another system called the hirakana, where they put uh, signs on the end and beginning to show tense or case according to what the words used in the sentence. And they've got a, yet a third one called the hir, another canon. I forget what the exact name is now. For modern words which are not, uh, no uh, example exists in the Japanese, so they make a separate language altogether and sign. I was just telling my wife about it. One in my extended family, one of the girls marries a Japanese guy. And I, I sat down at the table and we just had a bit of coffee. And I, I spelled his name out doing these ideograms. 
And then we got one of them wrong. He couldn't believe it. But it's devilishly difficult because it's so different to our way of doing things. Each one is an individual, beautiful brush. I, I don't know how they manage the typewriters. But anyways, going to Hiroshima, I picked up this girl. She wasn't a street girl. She was a very nice girl. And we used to meet on a Sunday afternoon, and it got you away from military life for a couple of hours. It was a great uh, delight. Then I told her I'd have to go home to England, and she started crying. So said, I'll come with him. I'm willing to come with him. And my father found out about this, and he said, she's not coming in my house under any circumstances. Because you know why, of course. The feelings of World War II. And it was physically very difficult to get at home anyway. Although one of my friends did marry a Japanese girl. I haven't told you that story, but I'll keep it for a minute. So anyway, it was an interesting thing to take my wife and daughter there years later. And it was the 30th anniversary of the bombing of Hiroshima. And they were both a bit uh, on edge about how they would be treated by the local occupants. But you know, the whole thing was handled by the Buddhist religion. The Buddhists have always been present in Japan. I, I took my wife and daughter to see a uh, bust of the great Buddha cast in bronze in the 11th century at Kamakura, which is on the edge of Tokyo. That's how far ahead they were with the Buddhists. It's the Shinto religion that became dominant and warlike and warrior-like and taught the Japanese the different standard of values. So we have two different, very opposing values. The Buddhists being in the minority, but still functioning. And the Buddhists looked after the ceremony when I went for that uh, particular day. And it went off very well indeed. There were people there from all over the world. And my personal comment on it is this. Every major statesman should be obliged to go to the museum in Hiroshima and see the photographs they took of the damage and the actual fire because the bombs, bombs we've got now are much stronger. And you talk about getting from war and fighting. I mean, you can destroy the whole of Vancouver with one go. And I don't think people realize that. They talk about it, but you've got to see a city that see that. Having said that, I've told you how Hiroshima revived itself. Uh, it's a bit of a paradox, don't you think? The human race is very resilient, but you don't want to try this. Anyways, I, my dealings with Japanese people who live in British Columbia, who lived during the war here, are a bit mixed. I talked to one of them in, who had gone back to Japan just in time before the war broke out because he, he thought it was going to be badly treated by the Canadian government. Well, they, it depends what you mean by badly treated. You were take, your property was taken away and you were sent up into the colonies or somewhere and your property was not given back to you. I talked to a man in Tokyo in the immigration about this and when he realized that I had personal interest in it, he, he put his work aside and he talked to me for a while. And he said, well, I can see that it's coming. And I was hard on my Japanese. I took my family back to Japan in time. He said, but if there'd been white guys in the same situation in Japan, God help them. They'd have lost more than that, probably. So that is one man's view of it. I think he's probably right. Because the way prisoners of war were treated by the Japanese 
was not up to Western standards, or let me say expectations. See, the Japanese hadn't signed the Geneva Convention, and to them, the prison war camp is an extension of the battlefield, and they do not like people surrendering. You fight until you die, and you're doing this for the emperor, and there's no debate, and it looks barbarous to Western minds. You ask Western soldiers to do a difficult thing. If they're brave and there's a chance, a chance, even if it's a small chance, they will respond. But if there's no chance, they don't like it. It's not part of the culture. But the Japanese still have this idea to die in battle is the ultimate honor. It's going back to the 12th century, actually, but that's the way it was. Anyways, I had a personal friend who was a Japanese guy who was dispossessed, and he became a quite a well-known architect in Vancouver when he got on his feet again. And he had no bitterness in his mind at all. He was lucky to be able to function when the war was over. He felt that. I can only say what he repeated to me. In Vancouver, the Japanese at the end of the war were forgiven and allowed to get on with their lives, but they didn't get the property back. And he, he said, OK, that's the way it is. I'll get going, and he became a very successful architect. I went to his funeral recently and met lots of Japanese people who both liked him and liked the Western friends he's got. So it's a very bewildering thing, isn't it? Uh, the, the, the school I told her, I told her I taught secondary school for a while. I was teaching a school, school called Gladstone, which is a very rough and ready school. I think most of those kids had, had enough before grade 12. They should be unloading ships at the dock. Riding around in desks was not for them. The big, strong guys, and they wanted some physical outfits, so I gave them rugby, and that did some good. Do you know this school on the west side, St. George's? We went over to St. George's and beat the hell out of them. <laughs> I, was, I never got along with any principal I worked with because uh, I didn't. But on that occasion, I did it. He said, I, he said, Langley, I hear you took the team over to St. George's and wiped them off the bloody field. I said, yeah, they're, they're only sported kids on the west side. Yeah, it, it was quite an eye-opener that glass them. And I, I've also told you that I still, and it continued, this, still get a Christmas card from one of them who was the biggest troublemaker. Well, I tend to bugger around. He became a, a fireman. He, that's how he said in his life. And the discipline and so on. I said, these, these kids don't have enough discipline. The, it, all these non theories. Um, see, I, I spent some time thinking about being a professional educator. Uh, as a few was in the education department, not the English department. And I, it's just in 1970 when that place was uh, in turmoil. Do, do you, you don't know much about it these days. It was uh, love in the news all the time. A big turmoil. What they wanted to do was imitate the antics of European students who grew up with demonstrations and barricades all the time. And they, they built a barricade at the bottom of the hill. And um, all that, they were playing the game. Now, I'll tell you how I took them in the pub and introduced them to the working class who gave them hell. <laughs> this big trucker said to me, I want my son to go to SFU. I don't want people like these kids teaching. 
Anyway, uh, from my point of view, I would have to go and get a PhD. And in those days, can you get a PhD at Sam Fraser in education? It was not available at the time. I'd have to go to Boston for at least two years and invite American theory to uh, probably didn't agree with it. So I packed it in and went the other way and got a degree in English and taught English instead. Uh, but that's, we have quite a bit in common, actually. I'm always nostalgic when I go back to Sam Fraser. Do you know that? Uh, SFU was much more pragmatic. Mm -hmm. Like in, I'm talking about the education faculty now. They have a, a, a, a time when you go out teaching. Uh, practicum. Uh, it, it lasts for a couple of weeks and they judge you on that. So I'm afraid you did a whole semester. It's just like being a doctor, you go on the ward and see what you can do. And I have a personal friend, he's passed away now, but he went through it in UBC. He failed, but they didn't fail him. He, he was not a teacher anyways. He just didn't have the innate whatever it is you need. That basically, how to deal with human beings. He, he was a mathematician, really, doing uh, you know, set of mathematical calculations. Nothing to do with dealing with blood and flesh people. On one occasion, when I was looking after student teachers, I, I engineered it so that. He came under my uh, leadership in some of the schools in Richmond he had to go out and teach. And he was no good. He was fine with the students. And he should have been failed, but UBC never failed him. It done everybody a favor, including him. But I always thought Simon Fraser was a fresh start. And they would have failed the guy. And it would have been a favor. I enjoyed everybody I met up there, but there was a f feeling of um, a new start, you know, a freshness. UBC is old and uh, it's built up a tradition of conventional ideas about what a university should be like. Yeah. I, I lived on the campus when I was going full time to UBC in the army huts. It was the last year they used the, the army huts. Anyway, we lived in an army hut, and it reminded me of my national service. <laughs> Isn't that funny? <laughs> Can't get away. Yeah. <laughs> we we the rent was forty dollars a, a month. I had a wife, and. Um, if you want to do some study, you just walk over in the evening to the library. And uh, I would come back when the kids were in bed, not being the noise and all that kind of thing, and do a bit more studying. But I think it was a bit of history in itself. There was one prof living in the army hut. He shouldn't have been there. He, he lived in it for a eccentric reasons. He taught music. And his name's on the tip of my tongue, and I can't give it to you. Next time I will. He played the piano, and his wife was a musician too. And they lived the way a student lived, but they were taking up student accommodation, which they shouldn't have done. But they lived very carefully. They didn't have a motor car. They went to Paris every spring. They brought back a lot of paintings and went to every country you could find. And they were totally eccentric. And they got away with taking up this little army hood. But just being there, there was still a military feel, feel about it. Do you know what I mean? Right. Yeah. The, the student buildings that they have now are quite uh, luxurious. Well, they got rid of those huts. 
with reluctance because I'd become a, a, a kind of uh, part of the history of World War II. Because there's always a feeling that the Japanese would do something on the West Coast. In fact, they did. Uh, a submarine did fire at that uh, lighthouse on the West Coast. Uh, that's documented. So there was some reason to have it. And in any event, they, they trained soldiers out there because it was just near the, the farm. When I was there, the farm was still next Agronomy Road. Agronomy, Agronomy Road was the edge of the farm, and people doing agriculture were using that space to look after animals and silly animals. And now it's all built up. Well, two things to say. It took me three weeks to get back to the civilian life. How's that? I had two weeks of uh, leave, paid leave, which wasn't very much, but two weeks to find your bearings a bit. And then I got a job teaching unqualified because teachers were such a premium. Uh, teaching, and I, it was advertised in the local paper. I went for an interview, got a job. It was in um, February of that year, March. And I thought, well, I'll try it out. I've never done any teaching, but I'll try it out. And I liked it. The, the, again, it reminded me of the kids I came to teach in Glasgow. It was in the Dockland area of Liverpool. And these are hillbilly kids, strong as hell. And I am in control in no time. But you've got to do that. And I thought, well, uh, this is OK. And I went to, in those days, they had a special uh, uh, stream of two-year uh, qualification. And I went to the teacher's training college which was in the idyllic part of the English countryside. And I met my wife there. Would you like a story about that? Well, it was a delightful place. It was a residential. Because you'd done your national service, you got it free. The people who had not done that had to pay the regular fees. But it was run on old-fashioned lines. There was where the, the dining room was laid out like a, a Oxford College with the, uh, the faculty along the top, tables at right angles, maids brought in things, put them on the middle of the table, was shared out. It was quite formal. Now, there was an arrangement where if you wanted some more food, you could go to this Dutch door. You know what I mean by Dutch door? The, the second half it operates independently and see if you could beg some leftover food. Now, it happened that that particular evening, this is early in the first semester, the rugby team had been suspended for bad behavior and my army skills came into full gear there. I managed to escape being uh, suspended. I was, you know, in the army, all, if you get into trouble in the army, it's real trouble. It's not just a slap on the wrist. And I, I managed to get out of it. I had all the fun without getting caught. I was the only one, but it was a pyrrhic victory. You know what a pyrrhic victory is? I had nobody to go to the pub with on a Saturday night. And there was a line of people trying to beg some food. And in front of me was this delightful young lady. And I always accused her of nego uh, negotiating herself, maneuvering herself to the spot in front of me. She denied that. But anyway, I put my hand on her shoulder and I said, what are you doing tonight? She said, I don't know. I said, well, I do know you're coming out with me. And that was the end of it. Now we've been married 59 years. Well, you think that's funny? That's fantastic. You, you, it's a virtue of the, there was a psychologist called, I was in a bit of a pickle there, 
But it didn't be good. Otherwise, I'd have gone to the pub with the rugby crowd. That was, uh, when I came, you know, a lot of people in my circle in Liverpool just wanted to get out of Britain because it was in 1945. They didn't realize how impoverished they were. When they uh, decounted de de the, the currency, I remember when a pound was 4.5 American dollars. And overnight, they reduced it to 2.5. That's a, uh, they had, the Americans provided lots of munitions, but they made the British pay for them. They didn't make the Germans pay for the, the rebuilding of Germany. They poured money into Germany because they wanted Germany as a bulwark against Russia and so on. It, it was the way things worked out. And the British were not aware of the fact that they had exhausted themselves and still haven't recovered, I think. That's my view, anyway. They still haven't got the, the lead in technology they used to have. And uh, uh, don't get me into that. Anyway, the, this, the, the, we were known as the two-year crowd. Now, my friends wanted to go to Canada immediately and get out of this quagmire. And I said to them, I'm not going to Canada or any other place until I got a qualification. I don't want to be working in the woods or washing plates or something. So I got the qualification, and I got on the train, went across Canada, got off the train from place to place. And when I got to Vancouver, I thought this will do me. And I got a job immediately because I had a qualification. And student, uh, teachers were still in demand. And so I walked off the train, went to see the uh, superintendent of Vancouver, and he says, there's only one thing to do. You've got to get your qualifications uh, recognized over in Victoria. So another friend took me on the ferry over to Victoria, which is delightful. And uh, they would rubber stamp my credentials, and I started teaching in Vancouver. and never looked back. Well, how about that? I really enjoyed teaching at all levels. I mean, as a son, afraid at the right time and all the time what was going on. I, I was the right time when I started the college system. I taught at Langara, but before Langara became Langara, we used um, King Ed, the actual building. It was the only... The, the, uh, the city of Vancouver were very adroit. They wanted to build a brand new high school. And it's, it's now called Eric Hamber. And CPR were also very gracious. They owned the property that is now Amazon. But they, they, they had the piece of the, uh, real estate. And the King Ed crowd also were spreading out along 12th Avenue. Now, the hospital wanted to extend the, the, the general hospital. So the city and the CPR did a very adroit, mutually beneficial trade. They gave them some room on 12th Avenue in return for a place to build Eric Hamber. Couldn't be better. And while they were building it, we used the old high school. And that was the beginning of the first college in... See, I moved with the times. And it, the enthusiasm of all those people was infectious. They were... They needed upgrading. And you are sitting in a class, even an English class. I say even an English class. Some of them found writing essays a bit of a strain. They... And, you know, Vancouver ran from grade one to grade eight. And both sexes left as grade eight. The girls got jobs washing dishes, and the men went and worked in the bloody woods. And not a lot of um, uh, background was needed. But all of a sudden, almost overnight, there's a call for more sophisticated qualifications. 
And it wasn't um, realistic to do grade 9, grade 10, grade 11, grade 12, four years. It didn't work. So they had a composite course of one year that encompassed the four grades. And that's what I was doing to begin with. And after that, I managed to stay on and get a proper job in the English department. And they then he transferred it from the old King Ed to the new college. And I spent the rest of my time in Rangara. Yeah. I tell you, the, the hardest job of, that I did at Rangara was not teaching. I was, I was president of the faculty association and keeping that crowd in the line was a challenge. And this is a personal thing. I did something that I recommend you do anyway. My predecessor, I sat in, I was vice president for a while. And usually the vice president automatically gets voted in as president yeah, in all kinds of situations. But one thing you've got to be aware of are the rules of parliamentary procedure. Now, the rules of parliamentary procedure are not understood by a lot of people. They talk about Robert's Rules, which is American as hell, and is not used in the parliament in Ottawa. I checked that out when I was in Ottawa. And the other thing is, my predecessor got into a tangle on the floor of a main discussion and he said I suspend the debate while I go down on the floor and talk to somebody who knows more about this than me and when he did that they, were, they, they broke up into little knots of people arguing and shouting at each other and he couldn't get the order back and it ended up in total chaos and I said to myself no way I'm going to let that happen I knew the rules of procedure from A to Z before it started. Uh, it didn't ever happen, and we had some close calls, and I'm not going into the politics of it, but I would have said, if you don't do what the chair says, I'm standing down. I'm not going to go through this quagmire. The, the chair will rule, and this is what I rule, because I've studied the rules. Don't get up in front unless you know the rules. I still have a copy on my desk of that. It's a good thing to have. Do you know the rules? You know, my wife only well, quite recently, there's something happened over in the legislature of Victoria on a naughty little issue, and she couldn't wait for me to come home. <laughs> and she said, what, what's happening? And I told her exactly what was happening. Right. And they got the procedure wrong. The procedure is laid out. And it's laid out by what happens in the Parliament of Ottawa of our country. And that's that, and there's no getting around it. They might going to do it slightly differently. Well, that's fine, that's what they want to do. But it's an, an interesting thing to do. No, it, it's interesting, you know, because you stare people down. If you don't like what I say, I'm resigning, because I know the rules, and they're not flexible. Otherwise, you have a, just a, a, a mob rule. About what did the army do for you? It taught you survival. And I think the survival incident came out. I didn't want to come to Canada without any qualifications. Otherwise, you'd be either a long time trying to get qualified, or you would be doing some third-rate job. I got the qualifications in my back pocket, then I came and I was welcomed. And I think the army told me that. This is the answer to that question. Very practical, it's not very romantic. But I, I balanced that by finding my wife in the process. Yeah, well the army told me that. In fact, all the criticisms of the well, you know, the way the army is run, the army has a strong uh, feeling of, you've got to get this right. The old sergeant major that I deal with, used to deal with the, in the Korean vets, 
He was a no nonsense correct. He, was, uh, he would correct me about little bits of ministry etiquette. And it's not a bad thing, I think, anyway. But I've been indoctrinated, so there you go. I think these kids who are doing drugs and getting into trouble and breaking the entrance should get on the parade ground with one of these sergeant majors for a couple of weeks. And anybody who doesn't toe the line gets into serious trouble. I, I'm a great believer in it. It doesn't do you any harm. What do you think? Well, uh, yeah. But it gives them a sense of um, self-discipline. You know, which these kids, a lot of them don't have. One of the problems is broken families, which uh, the, these kids are in a quagmire. They don't know who's in charge. And, uh, I feel a bit sorry for them. And when I was on the ship coming home, I was in charge of the draft who had joined up with, who had caught up with the regiment. See, when the regiment settled from Liverpool, well, here's a bit of cohesion, local cohesion. When the main regiment sailed, they were paraded through Liverpool with a bayonet fix, which is an honor, you see. And then they stopped outside the mess hall, the town hall of Liverpool, and were inspected by the mayor. Then they went directly onto the ship, which was tied up nearby. A big tie up. And one of my friends recently said to me, I went down to see you because I was working in one of these big buildings on the waterfront. And I said, well, how much time did you get for your coffee break? He said, I don't care how much time I spent. I, sp I spent two hours watching the whole show. If they fired me, I wouldn't care. But they wouldn't dare fire me because me of what I was doing. And that's the attitude. Um, staying together. And I could well be a Liverpool brother. Liverpool and Glasgow are very similar places. They're both very Celtic cities with a lot of um, po potential turmoil, but they make very good soldiers. Very good soldiers. And they I, I think I might finish with this little anecdote. I may have mentioned it. I was, for a while, I had to work along with my fellow soldiers who were very, from very rough background and very rough background where things were done, not done in the polite suburbs. They were taken for granted. They make good soldiers because their living conditions were worse than the career. I used to say to them, they used to have to be paraded to have a shower. Well, they had no showers in their houses. They didn't get washed, but they were none the worse for it because they, it was survival. When I was coming home, the same draft of soldiers were on the ship that I was going home on. I was a corporal, and it's very unusual for a national serviceman to get two stripes. And I was in charge of these guys, and it's the only time I put anybody in the, in the what I call it, the clink, in the cells down below. And we had the, the, the making trouble for people. Oh, I'll tell you the story, and then I'll finish, I promise. We had a big table, and somebody had to be designated a couple. Each time you had to go three and four decks. Have you been on the cruise ship? Well, all these decks, you've got to go up where the galley is, and you get the food in big containers. Every heart, you've got to carry it down and uh, put it on the table, and I took the honor of the job of sharing it out. Now, one side of the table were my buddies from the regiment, and the other side were members of the pay corps. And the pay cop weren't getting the, the chair of food. And my soldiers, infantry soldiers of foreign career, thought it fun to, to make the life misery of the little clerks from the May Corps. Now, if it hadn't been for me, 
and they were the South, the Pekor guys, because we didn't pick them up till Singapore. And they we're not used to rubbing shoulders with these kind of, shoulders with these kind of guys. And I, after that, I instituted, you know, equal rations. But one guy had to go in the clink. It's the only time I was there as authority. And they got the idea. The way it's done, you say, two men fall in, and the two old men next to him fall in. Take his belt off. You take the belt off immediately, and you've got no way of holding your pants up. Take his shoelaces off, and then they march him down the clink and leave him there for 24 hours by himself to think over oh, what's going to happen to him. Then he gets 24, he gets two weeks in the clink. It's not very nice, I can tell you. It's the only time I did it. Anyways, when I got on the ship, we used to have a quiz because it was long days uh, to go and very hard and very crowded. And this quiz was at midday. And I said to all these, uh, I'll call them scouts, that's Liverpool slang. They knew all the sporting things, the, the boxer and the the racehorse and the, and I knew the history, history and geography things and together we won it so often and the prize was a case of beer that they discontinued. <laughs> and it didn't do any harm for the discipline. He said, oh crap, we, you knew how to do things. Uh, that's built up camaraderie. Now, when we were back into civilian life, they phoned me up on a Saturday night and asked me if I'd like to go on a pub crawl with them. Now, that really goes a long way because you don't get that invitation from those kind of people easily. And you go to a bar in Liverpool, which is still a bit tricky negotiating if you're on your own. But with these guys, there's no trouble. But they saw it as a a backward bit of camaraderie. This is the guy who helped us on the ship and so on. We want him around. And you go in the bloody pub, they know what's happening. He's buying no drinks for the evening. And I did that quite, quite a while. And that's what camaraderie is all about, don't you think? It, it's intangible. You can't teach it, it has to happen. And it has to happen. I can go down the wrong street in Liverpool and be untouched. <laughs> when I walked into the dining room of that lovely teacher's training college in the southern part of the English countryside, a guy came running up to me and shook hands with me, and I didn't recognize him. He said, you saved my life. I said, what do you mean? He said, you saved my life on that troop ship. He said, I was in the pay corps. I'll never forget the way you ran the table. Yeah, it's a true story. He said, he was a nice little guy. God help him teaching in the rough area. But he said, you saved my life that day. Yeah, I was going to end on that note because you can't learn these things. You've got to feel it intuitively. You kind of know it was put in the clink, but this guy, he came out of the blue to shake hands with me. Uh, my, my girlfriend at that time, I told you about that. She said, What's, what happened? And I told her what happened in the bowels of a cruise ship where you've got to keep discipline because there's too many men rubbing shoulders. And I don't like discipline, but in the army, I learned that if you don't like discipline, you've got to find your way around it. Otherwise, they'll have the last words. They'll have the last words, don't worry. There was an incident on the Hill 355 when in January of 1953, the fighting became very fierce. The Chinese threw everything at it. And I was out of hospital at that point, but I was following the fighting in Korea very carefully. And there was a bit of battle between the Black Watch, that's 
uh, he released Scottish Regiment and the Chinese. And there's a National Service guy whose job it was to carry the ammunition up the hill to the front line itself. And he, he said to the Sergeant Major who was in charge of the ammunition, I've been there three times and I'm not going back there again. He was merely pulling irons and did two extra years as a natural salesman. It was not a good thing to do. If you, you don't want to go back again, you take your time going up the hill perhaps, but you don't challenge authority. That was an extreme example, but that's what they do to you. Well, you want ammunition at the front. Get on with it. You, you get to understand that these rules have a, a, a rationale. Sometimes they don't. On Christmas Day, 1953, we sailed from Japan in a small cruise ship and ran into a typhoon. And there was a good meal set up for us, but nobody wanted to eat it because it was too rough, and, um, except myself. I went to the galley and slid my tray along, loaded up with Christmas food, and when I eat my food, see, we, we used to sleep in the hammock over the mess table, but everybody was in the hammock spewing up onto the mess table. Come on, let's not be too squirmish about that. Those are the ways of life. I had the key to the orderly room, the headquarters, and I took my sleeping bag up there and my Christmas drink and my Christmas dinner. And all by myself, I sat down and had my dinner, drank my bottle of um, beer free and slept in a quiet seclusion. Thank you very much. And that's how the Korean community treat us. Mm -hmm. They cannot do enough for us. Unlike the Yanks who went to Vietnam and were ridiculed and booed. You put your life and limb on the line and what thanks you get for it. We were welcome. Still, that was only last summer. It's a, it's a, in my own personal record, that's a bit of a historical thing to have lasted that long. Don't you think so? I, I agree. The ranks have thinned out now, but there's, when I joined the unit, it was about 30 people, now it's down to six. Right. It's an inevitable attrition. But the Korean community here are so anxious to show their gratitude. It's, it's wells up in you. Uh, I, you must get that into the program somehow or other. Uh, we, we've, it gives you a feeling of that you've done something worthwhile. When you come to the Remembrance Day Parade here, right across the road, it is so many people in this community. I don't know. It, it, when I lived in Point Grey, I was not involved very much because there is no fo no focus. This is a focus for this community, and the same thing in North Van. There's a focus, and everybody turns out and everybody claps. And when the parade is over, you have the you go down the Legion and have a few shorts of rum that the Legion provide. Uh, they, there's, there's no tea, uh, uh, uh, but just a short of rum. But before you go, I think around and you, be, you wonder how many people, and they have to be recent immigrants, because they're all mainly Asiatic people, who ask you to pose for a photograph and thank you, and then the local people will come out and thank you. Shake your hand! Uh, that's different to the way the Yanks treated their soldiers when they got home. They booed them. So you feel, you can't help feeling like you've done something worthwhile. Sometimes, no matter what your philosophy is, if somebody's breaking into your house, what do you do? Lie down and ask them to take his choice? 
or kick him in the bum. And that's what we did in Korea. We kicked the bloody communists in the bum, and uh, they had to think twice about it. No. I could have tried to get a job as an officer, even as a national serviceman. They had a system where if you wanted to try, see the British officers were really selected because of their class and social background, unlike the Commonwealth officers. That's why uh, the, I, I had dinner with them on the train coming back from t Tokyo. They, they were there because of a confidence and the heads of the game. The Australians were there because they were very good soldiers. They all come from the back country, not these little the suburbanites. But um, where was it going with this? Um, Starting, you were saying you had the there was the option as even as a national service person to. Oh yeah, to yeah. Well, sorry, yeah. yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I deliberately see. I made decisions which are thoughtful decisions, and it keeps you alive. To be a, a okay, to be an officer, a second lieutenant is the lowest rank. When the the, the, the fighting stabilised in Korea. And it became like a, the World War I. Dug in on each side, wire in front of you, trenches, patrol at night. It's your job to take the patrols out and take them through the minefields and so on. I didn't fancy that. And I, I, I avoided it. I, I, maybe I would have become a second lieutenant. But I, I did the brainy job in the HQ in the audio room, drawing the map for the Winefields where, and I, I got a lot of prestige for that. One night I was coming up, around the corner to where the uh, HQ was, and I had rolled the maps in my hands like this, big roll, and this little whiff of snap of a second left turn to me, so there, you didn't salute me. And I dropped all the maps at its feet and said, do you want me to draw the maps wrong tonight or not? Because you've got to go out and play well up and throw. I broke all the column, because the last one, which he shouldn't do. But he could see the point. I am about to draw the pathway to the minefield for his night. Put it off! I told him that, and I got away with it. Now, I'm going to end with a thing about the Australian Major. Our regiment took the spark that the Australians had had in the line. The Australians had been fighting on Hill 355 for three months, and they'd done extremely well. And it was late at night, it's snowing like hell, it's an awful situation. And then I am, every, you break down the companies into platoons. There's about 25, 30 men. There was an officer in control, and then a major in control of the uh, units. And it's getting late, and uh, oh God. This Australian major is standing over me. And I, I'm typing the time they've actually got to get into the line, where they stand up, because it's about a mile away, and, and so on, with the direction for the King's Regiment guys to get up there. And this Australian major said to me, you know, hurry up, Mike, will you? He said, my men, well, well I had put an addendum to the order which was given to the second lieutenants. You must take a bandage and put the bandage around the swivel of your rifle so it doesn't clink in, in the night air, which is very still and tense. He said, uh, if anybody doesn't do it, they're in trouble. There's a lot of bandages around for obvious reasons. And I was about to do the umpteenth movement order in time that sends up. And this major said to me, you didn't write that, my, my men will make enough noise to drown it all. They've been in the line for three months and they'll all be drunk. 
and showed him about ten minutes later. <laughs> Coming down the bloody trail, singing Walter Mutter. It was the funniest thing, I'll never forget that. And the snow was coming down, and oh, God almighty. Well, I was different again. I had two years, although they did offer me another six months because I had everything running smoothly. And life goes on in funny ways. It's almost Shakespearean. If I had taken that extra six months, I had everything under control in Japan, I had a nice girlfriend, I would not have met my wife. I would have missed the uh, meeting in that training college because I wouldn't have gone in that year. Right. I'd have been the next year. Right. I want to occasionally talk about this. I was talking about a Christmas dinner, and this female said to me, well, well, how do you account for it? I said, she only Shakespeare knows the answer. And she said, what's that? I said, the stars are aligned. And she said, what? I said, the stars are aligned. Isn't as good an example as any you can come up with?